okay guys so the meeting is now live on youtube so only the presenters need to be here other people should log off from the meeting and go to youtube only the examiners and presenters should be here other people i will share with you the link on youtube so you can watch on youtube okay okay i have sent you a link on the chat window okay guys so i'm going to start now i'm just sending you all right so we are going to start now okay so uh, i have 34 people in this in this group i want to know why there are 34 people where there are only few speakers so um, okay it's okay if, the, if there is a problem then you can go on the youtube right so i'm going to now announce the name already we have spent a lot of time so let us start with team number 2 tenerif so team number 2 tenerif i am going to i am going to share my screen and show the presentation you have to start speaking now so i am going to present on our behalf i don't know team number 2 who is presenting the accident so this is nisha singh Nisha, this is a Tenerife accident. Are you the announced speaker? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, you are ready. Raghupati, you are ready. Hello, Raghupati. Sorry, sir, you were not audible, sir. Okay, wait a minute. I am not yes, audible. Sir, whenever really? she starts, I will start the timing. One minute. What did you say regarding audible? Sorry. Sir, if I can share my screen and present. No, not allowed because we have already taken the. I am going to. Don't worry. I'm. I have done it. You just have to tell me what to do. Okay, sir. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, sir. Start so speaking the and we start. Yes, yeah, start speaking. So, okay. but the presentation is not visible. The your screen with the uh, with the folder with and submission is visible on the screen. Okay, so then I will stop the share and do it correctly. What about now? is it visible now sir not visible now also uh, it, it is visible, visible sir. sir go ahead start 
So good morning, everyone. On behalf of Team Two, I'm Nisha Singh, and I'm going to present the report on air crash report on accident one, which is Tenriff Tenriff runway incursion. Next. Yeah, go ahead. Tell me to do the next. I'll do the it. deadliest. Uh, deadliest accident this was the deadliest accident in the history of civil aviation with more than 500 casualties involving two boeing 747 aircrafts and it happened when both the run both the aircraft collided on the runway at the tenriff airport next the first aircraft involved was the klm aircraft which was flying from netherlands to the grand canary airport with 16 crew members including captain jacob and the other aircraft that was flying that was flying was pan am which was flying from los angeles to the grand canary airport with 16 crew members including captain victor there were 380 passengers on this aircraft and 61 of them fortunately survived including the first officer robert brack next as i mentioned the two aircraft had their stop at the grand canary airport but there was a bomb blast on that airport on the same day and all the aircrafts were diverted to tenriff including both pan am and klm and tenriff being a regional airport only had one taxiway and one runway so due to the less space the aircraft were told to park on the taxiway in the investigation it was found that the klm was instructed to taxi till the end of the runway and make a 180 degree turn to take off but pan am was also told to taxi and take exit c3 but before the pan am could exit the the aircraft collided and the accident happened so there are next so there are few reasons which eventually led this accident the first was harid klm pilot as they had to return back on the same day and were already got delayed due to the diversion so they decided to refuel about 55 tons of fuel at the tenriff instead of grand canary to save some time next and due to the refueling the weight of the aircraft got increased leading to the requirement of more runway length for the takeoff the other reason was next was the weather at the time there was fog on the runway and the visibility was very low which was around about 300 feet so the atc and the aircraft pilot were not able to see each other next now comes the major cause of the accident at that time atc and aircraft were not able to see each other and using half duplex channel which is something very similar to walkie talkie and allows only one person to speak at a time if more than one person speaks the voices are inaudible next is the communication that happened between the aircraft and the atc the atc asked the klm to wait for the wait for the clearance and when they asked That's they replied good. with okay which is a non standard terminology so after hearing this the pan am crew reported they are still taxiing down the runway but this message got blocked and was inaudible to the klm crew next the klm captain pushed the throttle but the cockpit crew was little hesitant but didn't dare to stop their captain and when they saw the pan am it was already too late for any kind of preventive actions next the klm captain tried to take off but the distance between them was so less that they collided and after the disaster many changes were in next many changes created the crew resource management and the greater emphasis was given on decision making by mutual agreement next the use of standardized phraseology was introduced for example the term take off will be only used after the take off clearance is given next the major cause was also eradicated with the introduction of full duplex method to avoid any kind of interaction
So these were basically the improvements done to avoid this kind of accident in future. So this is all I got. I now request Major Rahul or Dial to please report, present a report on the second accident. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. No, no, don't do that, Rahul, don't do that. We are going to only make one accident per team per day today. So don't do that. Talk, don't. Rahul, don't don't speak. I'm going to stop the thing. Right, sir. I'm going to uh, go to the next team. Uh, but, but we first we have some questions. So, uh, Tiruvadi, did you manage the time? Because in between you said something and it was not clear. Oh, sorry. What, what did you say? You said time up. 20 seconds more. No, but you were ah, supposed to say 30 seconds remaining. remaining. Yes, sir. I said that only. No, nobody and the heard it. Time, I said the time is over. Nobody heard it. Nobody heard it. Oh, okay, because sir. you are not, you are to stop. You have to interrupt. See, so then I will type here. Then you will. You can, whatever. This accident also took place because of communication gap. Remember, because uh, something was, same thing has happened in the in our communication also. So be more assertive. Okay. When you start, you are the timekeeper. You have to be ruthless. After three and a half minutes, you have to say 20, 30 seconds remaining so that people have to acknowledge. And the speaker has to say Roger. That means they have understood. Otherwise, we'll have more accidents like this. Okay, I want now to uh, proceed further to the next accident. And uh, give me a minute. I want that one to be the uh, Quanta 72 incident. And that is uh, the Quanta incident is to be presented by Sunil Chandel of team number six. Okay. Uh, so, excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah. Ashwan here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, have to, we have to ask questions, correct? We have uh, to ask questions. I'm just giving an advance warning, Ashman, to the next team to be ready. All Ashman, right. Ashman, start with the questions. Okay. You know Four minutes for us also. Uh, so, uh, okay. sir, could you please tell me who the question is addressed to? It is addressed to the team. Okay. So, uh, my first question is that uh, it was mentioned in the uh, PPD that uh, towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, just a little bit before the crash, the weather had worsened and the visibility had reduced uh, be because of a uh, buildup of a lot of fog. So, uh, could you describe the uh, location, the geographic location uh, of the airport uh, due to which such kind of a problem uh, occurred? So the geographical location was the uh, Grand Canary Island, which is basically a, 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 an island uh, from the Tenerife, which is about 100 kilometers from the Grand Canary. Uh, no, so no. I, uh, what I, what I'm asking, to... excuse me, uh, what I'm asking is, uh, how was the uh, geography of the Tenerife airport uh, located such that it was affected by a lot of fog? You know, uh, normal airports should not uh, be affected by fog because... Uh, you know, it's just common sense that uh, there will be a lot of visibility issues. So, uh, what was peculiar about the location of this airport uh, due to which visibility was hampered by the fog? Uh, sir, sir. The evening? Uh, can I answer this way, sir? Yeah, yeah, from the same team? Anybody can answer from that team, no problem. Okay, sir, uh, the height of the Tenerife airport is uh, around 32 meters. And one minute, one minute, one minute. Saurav Sonkar, can you, sh uh, can you please, uh, I'm going to mute everybody and I'm going to now allow people to unmute them. Yeah, so the, now you can unmute the one who was speaking, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, sir, Vaino here. Uh, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, the height of the Tenerife airport is around 633 meters and uh, from the sea level, uh, the clouds were at 600 meters around. So, at the Tenerife airport, clouds were at, uh, on the runway. So, they were directly affecting the visibility. And at the time of the incident, weather was all not very uh, clear. It was raining. So, there were uh, clouds on the runway. Okay. So, you have answered the question. He asked you, what is peculiar about the airport geometry? So, uh, Ashman, go ahead. Uh, geography, sir. Uh, not the okay, okay, forget it. They don't know the answer. So go ahead. Okay, next uh, sir, I, I can answer that, sir. Uh, sir, the geography is basically it's a uh, Canary Island airport, sir. It's an island wherein uh, basically it's a uh, it includes nearby coastal areas and also situated at a significant height of 633 meters. Owing to this height, the elevation, and also due to the it being in the coastal area, an island specifically, 
there was lot of fog and there was lot of different various uh, very variation in density which had uh, led to the formation of fog in the uh, runway okay next question okay uh, so my next question is that uh, how was the two aircraft the two big 747s parked uh, on the taxiway such that uh, they had to leave right at the same time uh, such that one was taxiing along the runway and the uh, second 747 also had to simultaneously taxi behind the first 747 so uh, what were the conditions you know starting from the landing at the tenerife airport uh, to the point where this when both the aircraft start uh, taxiing to take off uh, from tenerife uh, how were these two aircraft positioned which led to uh, such a cumbersome situation uh, could you please answer that in detail yes uh, this is major rahul nodial uh, basically what had happened was uh, that this airport it was only a small airport which had one main taxiway and one main runway so because since all the major Hello? flights were Four minutes. I'm already. Over. I'm already. Four minutes over. Okay. Let him complete the answer. Yes. So because of uh, the all the major traffic which was directed to the airport, Tenerife runway, Tenerife airport, what had happened was that all the all the planes were parked along the taxiway, and there was quality of space on the taxiway to for uh, for an aircraft to move around. So what had happened was scale uh, in which the KLM was uh, the first in line and followed by the Pan Am aircraft. The KLM was to move back taxi. back taxi is a term when a part of the runway is used as a taxi way to work to go towards the initial part of the uh, runway so when that happens when that back taxi took place first klm went back taxi and went towards the start of the uh, runway which was to be followed by a uh, pan am aircraft now this pan am aircraft it was supposed to exit through a parallel mini taxi way at c3 but due to the visi- poor visibility and miscommunication it missed that and it ventured further ahead while back taxiing to the c4 c4 mini taxi way now the uh, klm aircraft again due to miscommunication and due to poor visibility even though it had not been authorized to fly it went towards uh, it went to take off now we have got two aircrafts one aircraft which is uh, going for the for the take off without any authorization in poor visibility and another pan am aircraft which is back taxiing for uh, for being next in line again in poor visibility and in poor communication and eventually what had happened that both the aircraft while the uh, pan am had not cleared the runway and uh, klm had gone uh, gone ahead with the take off both of them collided on the tenerife front way okay thank you rahul i think you have explained it quite well we don't have time unfortunately now right, i sir. go to i go to thank you so much i go to team number 6 and team number 6 the accident that you are going to talk about is uh, quanta 72 incident so i'll put the slide of team number 6 and i'll request uh, whoever wants to speak to speak about it okay so give me a minute please i'll just open that corresponding uh, ppt and then in between team number 6 can get ready okay team number 6 yeah sir yeah i am ready right this is sunil chandel Okay, so do I go ahead because yes. this is not the first one. Okay, so tell me where to stop. There you go. Go ahead. So Tiruvadi, Tiruvadi, remember I... you have to give thirty seconds timing. Yeah. Okay, the so screen is not visible. Yes, yeah, sir. No, I cannot see my PPT. One minute. On the screen. One minute. I'll I'll share my screen and uh, show it to you, please. Okay, is it visible now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, great. So there are some boxes. Don't worry; it will it will go. It will go. Be patient. Okay, is it okay now? Yes, sir. Right. You can start the moment you start, Tiruvadi. Your timer goes up. And remember, thirty second warning loudly. Sure, sir. Go ahead. Okay. So this will. Uh, uh, my name is Sunil. I am. Uh, I am doing Qantas Flight Seventy Two investigation from the behalf of Group Six. and uh, next slide sir okay so this was a airbus 330 aircraft and it departed from singapore with 303 passenger plus 12 crew crew members uh, the good part is there were no fatalities in this accident uh, next sir okay so there were two pitch down uh, pitch down events uh, one is the 440 utc and one after 2 minutes the second pitch down event happened 
uh, and the autopilot were disengaged before both of the pitch-down uh, events. And at uh, 5.32, the aircraft landed on Lair Mirth Airport, uh, not desired. Uh, the uh, next slide, sir. Okay, so the origin of fault were the corrupted ADRU, uh, uh, corrupted ADRU data. The one of the AD, uh, there were three ADRU in the aircraft, and one of them giving uh, like ambiguous data. Like there were multiple spikes in uh, ADRU data. So because of this, there were two pitch down happen and some several uh, ECAM system warning also there. Uh, next slide, sir. Okay. So the main reason was that uh, one of the ADRU CPU were corrupted and it relabeled the angle of attack data in ADRU. Next, sir. Next slide. Uh, so it uh, converted like altitude data into uh, over mm -hmm. angle of attack data and the angle of attack data will be very high. So it triggered a high AOA protection mode and this happened uh, like nose down moment happened because of this also the main reason was fcpc algorithm not handled this angle of attack uh, uh, incorrect angle of attack data because there were multiple spikes uh, uh, apart from 1.2 seconds so the major reason of major injury was the the 60 of uh, aircraft passenger were not uh, seated with seat belts so they feel like a major of jerk in the, the back spines. Uh, next, sir. Okay, so learnings. So like we can test, uh, like bet we can use uh, better CPU in our ADR use. And the second one was the our algorithm for uh, our failed algorithm was not very robustly. So we can test uh, our FCPC algorithm robustly in all possible failure modes. And we can like train crew to better because when first pitch down happens, they can have like uh, seat belt all the passengers and avoid the major injuries. Also, if they switched off the flight computer, the pilot manually handled and the second pitch down never happened. Okay, next, sir. Uh, like these are all the references. Okay, <clears throat> right. Uh, Ashman, you can start the questioning now. Okay, so uh, Sunil, you mentioned that uh, the angle of attack data has uh, uh, and the altitude, uh, these two labels in the IDU, they had been switched. So uh, due to this, the pilots, they received uh, two warnings in the cockpit simultaneously. One was the overspeed warning, warning as well as the stall warning. Due to this, uh, there were two protections uh, that kicked in, uh, the automatic protections that kicked in into the uh, into the system, which which was responsible for uh, pointing the nose down. So uh, what was the name of these two protection systems and by how much degree did they point the nose down? Okay, so for the one one of was the um, high pro high angle of attack protection mode, and it triggered like uh, there were two pitch down moment. Now the first was eight degree around, and so, the second Sunil, one minute. Sunil, one Sunil, one minute. I want to know whether Anurag Kumar can answer this question. Are you there, Anurag Kumar? Anurag Kumar, are you there? Okay, Pratik Kamble, are you there? Um, uh, sir, 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 only designated speakers were asked to allow. Uh, oh, right, you are join. right. You are yes, right. My, my sir, may, may I answer, sir? What's your name? This is Konrad Devashish. Love, I'm from team one. No, no, this is, supposed, this is supposed to be this team, na? group six. Yeah, yeah, sir. Devashish is from my group, like we subdivide our team. Na? Sir, group six. I'm from group six only, sir. Uh, but you are from team one. Uh, yes, sir. Ah, so then why? So because because sir, oh, oh, sir, only one speaker is present in this team because they are only allowed to <laughs> that, enter. That I agree. That I agree. Yes, I sir, only yes. did that. I only did sir, that. Sir, sir. Okay, fine. Anyway, you can answer. Yes, go. Devashish, you yes. can answer. Yes, sir. So, uh, like in the first pitch down event, sir, the, uh, the autopilot was engaged. So, there are namely two safeties. One is um, high uh, pitch uh, pitch rate safety, and other one is a high angle of attack safety. So, uh, 
so high pitch rate safety pitch in when autopilot is engaged and if the high pitch rate uh, safety is triggered sir like uh, uh, it will give a uh, nose down of 6 degrees in this case and the autopilot autopilot will disengage as happened in the first pitch down when the autopilot engage the autopilot disengage and there was a pitch down of 6 degrees also simultaneously high aoa uh, safety which uh, which created nose down of 4 degrees also kicked in because it is independent of autopilot engagement it is dependent on the angle of attack value so total of 10 degree pitch down occurred due to uh, kicking of both the safeties okay okay thank you that's uh, that's okay any other question ashman uh, yes one more question so uh, could you please uh, you know briefly mention about another a similar incident uh, which which occurred uh, and it did not cause into a catastrophe or a disaster like this flight contest 72 so uh, could you please mention what what protective steps did the pilots take in order to prevent such a catastrophe uh Yeah. Yes. Like it was mentioned of finding also there was one more similar incident in what at around thirty thousand, thirty seven thousand cruising altitude, the same pitch down occurs. So the pilot switched off the primary uh, computer itself. They, they didn't allow any system safety to work, and they were flying totally manual. Manual, manual, completely. It manual, occurred yeah. totally uh, on the same type of aircraft, A three thirty sir. Okay. So Ashman, can we go ahead, or do you have another question? Uh, no. I I think okay. it's fine, sir. We it's can fine. Go okay. So we'll now go to team number seven. Team number seven. Uh, yes, sir. Team number seven. I'll tell you which accident I want you to look at. So team number seven. Talk about the L L one eight six two accident. I'm going to just share the screen. Uh, give me a minute. Uh, sir, can you hear me? One minute. I can hear you. Let me first put the PPT on. Okay. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, I'm just stopping the other presentations so that we have. Yes. So team number seven, L L. So tell me what slide number should I go to? I'll go to the. I'll go to the next half minute. The screen is not visible. Slide number fifteen. Okay, it's coming. Wait, it is coming. It will come. Let me first go there. Right, visible now. Yes, sir. Okay. Give me one minute. Okay, so uh, you can start now. In number seven. Okay. Now we will be looking at the case of LL one eight six two cargo jet which took place on the fourth of October nineteen ninety two in Amsterdam. Next slide. We will examine this incident under the following headings. Next slide. This case highlights the importance of structural design, performance, and maintenance in assessing the risk of failure. Next slide. Now we will look at the sequence of events. The Boeing seven four seven two hundred F takes off from Schiphol Airport at nineteen twenty one hours. At 1926 hours, after ascending 6,500 feet, the pilots receive a warning of failure from engine three. A minute later, engine four follows. The experienced pilots manage to stabilize the plane and take a turn and decide to do an emergency landing at Schiphol Airport. However, while descending, as the pilots lift the nose of the plane in order to reduce velocity, the plane begins to roll rapidly towards the right, and the pilots lose complete control. This causes the plane to nose dive from 2,500 feet into an apartment complex at 1935 hours. Claiming 43 lives, including the lives of three crew members aboard. Next slide. Now we will look at what happened during this unfortunate incident. Engine three gets detached from the plane due to a fuel spin failure and collides with engine four, dislodging it while also damaging the leading edge of the right wing. This causes reduced lifting forces on the right wing due to disruptive flow, so leading to the landing phase becoming uncontrollable and ultimately crashing the plane. Over to Raman. Looking closely at the mid part section, the first failure was of the fuse pin, followed by the ductile failure of the inboard mid part lug. Let us understand the pylon attachment in the subsequent figures. Next slide. Due to the damage in R3, which is a mid part fitting, it resulted in weakening and damage to the R4 fitting, and ultimately led to damage in R5, which is a side link. With the loss of R5, there was no lateral control of the engine, and thus it resulted in overloading of R1 and R2 links. Which led to detachment of engine from the wing. 
Another significant reason was the fail-safe design of Boeing 747 in the next life cycle. The design assumptions of safe separation were incorrect. Existing data on engine separation of other Boeing aircrafts were proved to be wrongly predicted. The design assumptions can be better understood in the following video, sir. The next slide. With respect to the assumed separation forecasted by the Boeing 747 designers, the engine assembly was supposed to detach and move from the top of the wing, whereas in actual case, the engine detached laterally and collided with the adjacent engine number four, causing a significant damage to the wing leading edge. Next slide, sir. As a result, there was a limited controllability of the aircraft. To reduce the rate of descent, the pitch was increased, which, which deaccelerated the aircraft. With an increase in angle of attack, there was increase in drag, which led to the reduction in speed. To maintain speed, engine thrust was thrust increased. Due to higher thrust asymmetry, the aircraft started to roll towards right. Let us look at the aftermath of this incident. Next slide, sir. Post this incident, there was a re-inspection of the entire Boeing 747 fleet fuse pins and an acceleration in attempts to design corrosion-proof fuse pins. Uh, next slide, sir. From this incident, we learned that the fuse pins must not have notches which provide a location 30 seconds left. for crack initiation 30, 30 seconds left. and growth. Okay. In subsequent figure, next, next slide, sir. We noticed that there was a transition from bottle bore pin design, which was at the highest stress factor, towards the straight bore pin on the right. Next slide, sir. In, in the aircraft strut, there was a replacement of aluminum mid spar fitting with titanium, important improvement in corrosion resistance practices and mandatory inspection programs. More importantly, there was a change in design philosophy wherein the assumptions in the previous designs were confirmed for present aircraft development. Next slide, sir. Time up. Yeah. Time up. That's all okay, that's it. Very good. Excellent presentation. Excellent presentation. I really commend you. Very crisp and very nice. Uh, Ashwan, over to you for your questions. Uh, okay. So, uh, in this crash, we see that uh, two engines have been detached. Okay. So, uh, still we see that uh, even after the two engines were detached and they fell off from the plane, uh, the plane was able to fly for around seven to eight minutes in the air uh, before it crashed. So, like technically, a Boeing 747 should be able to fly on the remaining two engines. So, uh, in an attempt to perform the emergency landing, why did the plane crash at that time? So, why was it able to stay airborne for eight minutes? And uh, during the attempt to land, why did it crash? Yeah, so I'll be answering this question. I'm calling it a Valadi at this side. Initially, what happened was once the uh, airplane was uh, cruising, it was at a sufficient speed, moreover, it was a steady flight with uh, uh, with no uh, amount of a steady uh, climbing there. So uh, after the pilot, you know, realized that there was a failure of both the mm, engines, both of them had been detached from the mm, mm, aircraft. There was an attempt which was being made in order to land at the nearest airport in the shortest possible time. Whenever it is being done, a approach has to be made keeping into mind the shortest vectorial but distance once that thing was being initiated at that particular time in order to control the rate of a descent there was a uh, there was a requirement to decrease the speed and increase the angle of attack as soon as the angle of attack of that particular aircraft was increased, we know that there was a, around two meter disruption to the airflow because of the broken leading edge of the right wing, which led to the disruption of flow, ultimately led to the lesser lift which was being generated by the right wing. And once in order that the, ang that the angle of attack of that particular aircraft was uh, was um, done. Uh, it all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, you. You answered uh, the question. Yeah. Uh, okay. So one more question I want to ask is, uh, how did the investigators find out that uh, the engine number four had been hit by the engine number three? Yeah, with uh, with you know uh, with you know respect to that, once the engine number four was being was being recovered from the the, the sea on the front portion of the engine number four, a black amount of uh, coating, which was the same coating, which was a part of the engine number three which got hit to 
engine number four, but there was a black mark which ultimately led them to understand that it was possibly being hit by that particular engine, and the same was being uh, investigated. Uh, all right, and one last question. Uh, so there is one more example of such a crash. Uh, where this Boeing's uh, Boeing's fail, uh, you know, the the fail proof system that you mentioned had failed and led to a seven four seven crash. So LL one eight six two was one such crash. Uh, can you mention the other crash, uh, which which uh, uh, due to which the Boeing seven four seven crashed in totally similar circumstances? Yeah, there was one more crash of a Chinese airlines which had taken place just months before this accident. All okay, right. thank you. I think we should go ahead now with team number nine, British European Airways Flight Six Zero Nine. Okay, British European Airways Flight Six Zero Nine. Let us start with that, and then uh, the next accident. Uh, I will let you know, but I think it's visible, so this team should start. Yes, sir. So, uh, what's your name? Sir, my name is Archana. Archana, welcome, Archana. Welcome from Sri Lanka. Um, Thank you. Go ahead. As you start speaking, the timer will be started. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Here we are to present the case study on British European Airways flight incident 609. Next. It contains introduction and how it happened. Finally, what happened? Analysis made on this incident and what are we going to do the improvements that to avoid it in the future. Next. Feb the 6, 1958, British Airways Airspeed AS Ambassador get prepared for the for its takeoff with 38 passengers and six crew members on board with experienced pilot. The aircraft have to stop in Muni because it didn't have sufficient fuel to get back to the Manchester from the Belgrade without refueling. Next. Next. In a moderate snow and the temperature near freezing, the uh, before slide. The freezing pilot requested for the clearance at around 530 hours, uh, but they would they could not obtain the required takeoff velocity of 119 knots and abandoned the takeoff due to the port side engine surge. The aircraft taxis back to the, the taxi back to the runway for the second takeoff attempt after four minutes. Again, it was abandoned, returning the terminal, reporting the technical fault. Next, sir. With the technical advice from the station engineer, they prepared for the third takeoff at around 16.02 hours. Runway is more than 900 meters, so that they have decided for the gradual acceleration. They reached the velocity about 117 knots after around uh, 1,200 meters, which they could have abandoned the mission. But the suddenly they experienced the velocity drop to 105 knots. Next. Next, this is the aerial view which shows the aircraft part out of the runway. It has crashed through the fence hitting the house and the fuel shown by the red ground nearly about 300 meters beyond the end of the runway. Next. Major factors which could have led to the accident were like inexperienced air crew. From pilots little they were having enough experience to fly the aircraft efficiently. Improper loading of aircraft. The team investigated that the aircraft CG location was metered as per the OEM norm, so this reason was also vanished. Low, low grade of aircraft fuel would have been another reason leading to less thrust generation. So fuel sample was taken, investigated and found that fuel used was of educate standard. Inefficient power from engine. From the two abundant flight, the power from engine was investigated leading to found that aircraft engine was in proper condition to uh, attain the power icing of undercarriage due to rolling friction this is icing between there is a formation of icing between the undercarriage wheels which was not the reason for the accident next slide please Uh, due to icing on wing, the shape of the wing will change. Uh, will change. Uh, will change the airfoil profile, uh, wing profile, which may change the performance parameter, leading to increasing profile drag. Next slide. Uh, 
uh, slush on runway was another reason due to accumulation of uh, accumulation of snow on the runway which may lead to uh, which may lead, uh, where slush will stick to the nose causing nose down tendency of the aircraft leading to decrease in velocity next slide 30 seconds left uh, there were some of the improvements taken left. into consideration that the stringent reicing protocols were mandatory to all the aircraft landing there and better uh, improvements uh, research was taken into consideration improvement on the reicing techniques better understanding of aircraft operating on slush runway was uh, taken into consideration as uh, it may ha might have caused and it was made mandatory for all the aircraft to not take off when uh, slush is of 5 cm next slide next slide uh, these are the images taken for uh, at the runway next slide time up yeah next slide time up next time slide. up okay okay Done. time up Done. all right so ashman over to you yeah so uh, please, the... uh, yeah, please mute everybody else can mute themselves yes go ahead okay so uh uh when the german investigators uh, initially published the report of the crash they found that uh the uh, the crash had been caused due to pilot error so uh, what uh, what error did they think that uh, that the pilot had made and uh, also you know the, uh, this error was later cre uh, cleared in the subsequent inquiries that uh, that were made on this accident so uh, why was the pilot cleared of this particular error which i want you to talk about anybody from the team can answer maybe right now only the people who are there hello uh, sir can i hello sir. okay yeah go ahead don't waste time just answer okay sir the the i uh, because of net i just and uh, got the half question but i'll uh, answer the question no, i understood repeat the question repeat the question no problem repeat All the right. question uh, so in the initial inquiry which was uh, set up uh, set up by the germans they found that uh, the main reason of the crash was pilot error so uh, there was one particular thing that the pilot was suspected of you know either doing or not doing but in the subsequent later inquiries the pilot was cleared of any blame for the crash so uh, could you please elaborate on what the supposed pilot error was okay i'll just elaborate on this uh, during the german uh, investigation what they uh, suspected or they their final conclusion was that the uh, accident happened because of the icing on the wing and the pilot uh, pre flight uh, during pre flight inspection they he did not clear the ice from the wing and uh, uh, that's why the pilot was blamed for not uh, uh, deicing the wing before the flight and he was blamed however uh, uh, almost 10 years uh, the pilot and the uh, uh, european uh, or british uh, airline uh, did the research and finally they found out that the uh, problem was from the uh, sludge of the runway and subsequently uh, the european and the british air investigation team cleared the pilot uh, of all the charges uh, from the all right, uh, all right. Oh, thank you and it yeah. was okay Thank, thank you, you so and, much. Uh, one, thank you. One more question. Uh, uh, so there was one popular football team uh, which was on board this aircraft. Could you name that team? It was Busby Bay. Uh, it was Busby Bay of Manchester United team. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ashman. Very good. Any more questions to ask? Uh, no, sir. They okay. 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 Good. Covered everything. Right, right. Actually, in the interest of time, I am not asking any questions, nor am I asking Saurabh to do it, because we are supposed to cover a lot of ground. Next accident will be China Airlines flight CL611. And that is team number eight, right? So I'm going to share the screen for team number eight. Uh, team number eight, you can... Uh, Sir, can I just make one small request before you start the presentation? Yes, sir, yes, yes. Go ahead. One small thing, sir. If you could just go to the second slide and see if the video is working or not, sir. Because what we had practiced for is we had practiced for us presenting it. Uh, Don't sorry. worry. Video, video has worked for the previous presenter. Remember, it has worked. So it should work. Don't worry. Okay, it should sir. work. We, we, you have to keep in mind, Vivek, that whenever we have only four minutes for uh, making a presentation, we should avoid all these fancy things because... If the fancy things don't work, then we don't have time to overcome it. Okay, so that is a part of the planning, but it okay. is okay. I hope it will work because uh, it has worked for the last one. Okay, sir. okay. So over to you now. In your team, 
there is a presenter and then there are other people who are presenting so i have no problem with that go ahead team number 8 your time will start now the moment you start speaking the timer is on yes good morning everyone today team 8 is going to cover an airline accident which happened on 25th may 2002 with china airline flight ci611 next i want to start the presentation by showing a small video clip that shows the gist of what happened right so it's not uh, it's going to google drive and it is going to search in the google drive is going to show i don't know i can see it but i don't know about other people the video As you can see when the aircraft was in its climbing is, stage was the wait wait is the video visible to all yes, yes sir it is visible to us crack started developing rapidly in the empennage this led to complete severance of the empennage due to which the complete aircraft disintegrated in mid air and its parts fell in taiwan strait next slide please a quick a quick introduction to the accident the aircraft type was a boeing 747200 all 225 people on board lost their lives in the accident the most probable cause for the accident is attributed to improper structural repair next the events unfolded as follows the flight was cleared for taking off at 7 minutes past 3 pm after 3 minutes the type approach instructed the pilots to fly direct toward charlie after 2 minutes the flight engineer contacted china airlines operations regarding flight info next after 4 minutes type area control center controller instructed the pilots to continue its climb from flight level 200 to 350 and this was the last transmission received from the aircraft At 28 minutes past 3 p.m., the type of area control lost radar contact with the plane, and soon an immediate search and rescue operation was initiated. Two and a half hours later, floating wreckage was sighted on the sea near Penghu Islands. Now I'll hand over the presentation to Ram. Here we can use the Swiss model cheese to determine the cumulative effect, which led to the mid-air flight breakup. The given picture clearly illustrates that although there are many layers of difference between hazard and the accident, when the flaws in each layer align, it can allow the accident to occur. Now coming to the improper maintenance section, 29 scheduled corrosion prevention and control program inspection items were not accomplished and properly documented. On November 2001, during the repair assessment program for the repair dugger, the traces of staining were neglected, which was a clear indication of hidden structural damage beneath the dugger. Inefficient non-destructive inspection technique were used. In 1980, permanent repair of the tail strike was not accomplished in accordance with the Boeing Structural Repair Manual, which led to the creation of multiple side damage due to metal fatigue as the repair dugger did not extend sufficiently beyond the entire damaged area to restore structural strength next two main lessons were learned from the accident from a structural point of view skin surface scratches scrapes and other form of damages can cause stress concentration to occur and result in the formation of fatigue cracks when subjected to subsequent structural loading conditions and from the organization point of view safety programs must either be accomplished and consistent with the original airplane safety features or the effects of these programs must be accounted for during all subsequent airplane operation and maintenance activities several, reco several recommendation of the investigation authorities were made one important one was that any airline authorized manuals were not to be used only original equipment manufacturers manual was to be used another important recommendation was to audit corrosion prevention and control procedures and get it vetted and approved if any amendments were to be made thank you everyone now we are open for any questions uh, all right so uh, the first question i want to ask is uh, so see you mentioned a tail strike that happened 22 years ago uh, 22 years exactly 22 years before the crash of this airplane so uh, due to the scratches and the cracks that were formed from that tail strike how did it uh, 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 like you also mentioned the point of metal fatigue so how did the whole hull break apart from the airplane as a result of metal fatigue so like what i want you to explain is uh, how uh, what what caused the metal fatigue to happen over the years yeah okay so this is uh, vivek here 
i'll take this question uh, regarding this so yeah so what has happened is that because there was some damage 22 years ago now how they've repaired it is by covering up the damage with a i mean that's the standard way of doing it is you put a doubler plate and you rivet it onto the structure so that you keep the uh, stresses from concentrating on the previous damage but what has happened is that because of the improper fitment of this doubler plate that uh, crack has still been exposed to stresses and it has still acted as a con- stress concentrator so now because of the varying loads that the aircraft faces in take off landing and in air and during maneuvering and every such thing the uh, the thing is that a fatigue crack generally of this nature builds through the thickness of the skin so generally there are a lot of micro cracks that propagate and at one certain instant all of them interact together and then form the major crack and now that is what has happened in this case where the cracks adjacent to the main uh, to the repair site have built these micro cracks over time and it has simultaneously interacted with each other during this particular sortie because of which uh, this crack has uh, propagated at such a high rate and it is uh, sheared off from the tail part very good answer very very good answer i am really very happy at the clarity you have expressed okay next question asman uh all right so yeah just a second yeah one more question i want to ask is uh, so uh, since this uh, you know this defect was present in the aircraft for more than 20 years why was it never caught in any inspection why was it never spotted that is one of the uh, observations uh, that is one of the layers of the swiss cheese model like we've explained so uh, apparently there was uh, in that time there was on board smoking allowed and the smoking had actually allowed the stains to come out of the uh, repair site and people who were doing the inspection despite uh, doing what they did could not catch this so that's that's the whole uh, precursor to why this accident has happened the way it has happened all right uh, i don't have any more questions thank you okay great uh, now we go to team number 1 so team number 1 uh, the next accident is uh, pacific southwest airlines flight 1771 uh, i hope you can uh, see the screen i am sharing the screen with everybody uh, so team yeah. number 1 the authorized speakers can uh, take over remember you have 4 minutes and uh, ragupati so when ragupati gives you a warning you have to acknowledge by saying roger so that he knows that you have heard him right sir start sir am i audible ab- absolutely audible loud and clear start thank you uh, hello everyone i am maitreya sana and i will talk about the crash of pacific southwest airlines 1771 next slide sir okay flight 1771 took off from los angeles on 7th december 1987 at 3:30 pm After 45 minutes into the flight, the pilots reported gunshots to the air traffic control. Moments later, the aircraft plummeted towards the ground in a dive, crashing at a supersonic speed in an isolated hill 280 kilometers from Los Angeles. The intensity of the crash obliterated the aircraft, leaving no survivors. The subsequent, sir, the next slide, please. Thank you. The subsequent investigation focused on two possible modes of crash. There was known trouble with this particular engine model. with three other flights fitted with the same engine having faced engine failure previously and two of them facing engine fires it was possible that an engine fire might have brought down the aircraft apart from this there was also evidence from the cockpit voice recorder that pointed to a criminal action the investigation revealed the cause of the crash a disgruntled ex employee of the airlines had committed murder suicide trying to kill his boss who was on the same flight as a payback he had used a gun that he had smuggled on board taking advantage of the airline policies at the time to allow airline staff to bypass security check next slide sir thank you the aircraft model was a british aerospace bae 146200 which was a short haul airliner that was manufactured by british aerospace it was a high wing monoplane with a t tail with four turbofan engines and a retractable landing gear it was mostly operated by regional airlines for the cost effectiveness on short routes The aircraft was powered by four AL502 turbofan engines, which were high bypass ratio engines. These engines had experienced multiple issues where the internal electronics could overheat. Also, there was a threat of internal icing due to which there was a loss of engine thrust. Next slide. Sir. Thank you. 
As a result of the crash, Federal Aviation Authority directed the airlines to implement certain security protocols to prevent such aircraft accidents from happening ever again in the future. Primarily, they, detected, they directed the airlines to mandate employees to be subject to the same screening as regular passengers and not allow them to bypass security checks. Further, on termination of employment, the airline credentials issued to the employee were to be seized immediately. Corporations also implemented policies requiring their executives to travel via different flights. There was also some lesson around the cockpit door operation to prevent unauthorized access to the cockpit. However, the cockpit doors were not reinforced due to weird concerns. Next slide, sir. Thank you. The main cause of the crash was rooted in the airport security checking protocols at the time. The lax security checks were the cause of extremely high rates of skyjacking. In spite of this, airlines were opposed to the idea of individual passenger screening. There was no ID requirement and the ticket agent would visually check the passengers to look for any hijacker behavior like lack of eye contact or inadequate concern for luggage. Very few passengers were scanned by a scanner and even fewer were frisked. It was only after the 9-11 attacks that airport security began to be taken seriously with machines and detectors being put into place for mandated universal passenger screening. Next slide, sir. Thank you. Compare that to present day, the security is much well thought. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir is much well thought and stricter. All passenger baggage is subject to screening. Sharp tools and liquids which can be used as weapons or bombs are subject to security checks and limitations. Passengers themselves must pass through a metal detector and millimeter wave scanning devices to ensure that they are not carrying any concealed weapons with them. Next slide. 30 seconds left. Thank you. Next slide. Sir. Roger that. The cockpit doors are one of the many possible obstacles set out to prevent unauthorized personnel from taking control of the aircraft. The cockpit doors in 1987 were not locked, giving access to all. This was one of the reasons David Burke was able to gain access to the cockpit and able to crash the aircraft. Today's cockpit doors are reinforced against even blasts to prevent unauthorized entry. Cockpit doors are operated by a simple locking procedure which requires at least two people inside the cockpit at all times to ensure one person does not take control of the aircraft. Pilots have the ability to deny access to the cockpit from within. Anybody wanting to have access to the cockpit must first wait for 30 seconds or five minutes depending on the settings of the lock. Time Pilots up. can also see who is asking. Time access. up. Time up. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Okay, great. Bang on time. Okay, so Ashman, over to you. Uh, yeah, so what did this fellow uh, David Burke do inside the cockpit which led to the crash? I mean, look, smuggling uh, weapons into the aircraft does not cause a crash. What caused the crash? That's so, what I want to know. Yeah, so what happened is that he took the weapon on board 45 minutes into the flight. He gave a, a he on a sick, uh, airline sickness bag, he wrote a small message which I had shown earlier. And he gave that to his boss. After that, he went into the washroom of the plane, took out his weapon and came out and shot his boss twice. Then he shot the airline uh, passenger uh, cabin crew and entered the cockpit. Then he shot two uh, shots on the pilot and the co-pilot. And then the last shot was unaccounted for. He might have shot himself or one of the other passengers on the plane who might have tried to enter. And he put the control yoke forward, pushing the airline, uh, pushing the plane into an uncontrolled dive. Nose down position and then the plane crashed. All right. Uh, thank you. And one more question. Uh, so, in your opinion, uh, were the uh, key learning outcomes uh, that were taken from the crash and the improvements suggested after the crash were they sufficient in order to uh, in order to prevent any further uh, more dangerous hijackings from happening? Uh, well, no, because. Uh, even after this crash, there was a, even before just this before this crash, there was a similar crash which I had again given them hidden slides on the uh, on the PPT, which was exactly similar. A passenger who was mentally challenged went into the flight, shot a pilot and co-pilot, and then crashed the plane, which was eerily similar to this one. And apart from that, even 14 years later, the 9/11 attacks happened because of the lack of similar protocols which were set out by this plane, by this accident. So the learning lessons learned were not enough. All right. Uh, sir, I just want to add on that. Uh, this is Pradeep Pali, sir. Yeah. Uh, like uh, every suggestions which was given that time was like not implemented. Like we kept on continuous improvement because uh, other factors were also considered. As uh, Matria said, uh, at the 9/11, uh, after 9/11 incidents, we could uh, reinforce cockpit and uh, make it more intelligent. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, good. So now let's move to team number three. Fly Dubai incident. Uh, team number three B, as they call themselves, uh, they have gone for a bypass. Okay, great. So uh, I'm sh I'm sharing the screen, and uh, I will invite you to present now. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Absolutely audible. 
Yeah, sir. This is Akhil Tela, and this presentation is about why the YFZ and it crash that took place in 1921-2016. Next, sir. It was a Boeing 737-800 aircraft, and it was scheduled from Dubai to Ross London Airport, but unfortunately, it crashed on the runway of Ross London, and there were no survivors. Next, sir. The uh, sequence of events were followed like uh, it was a delayed departure, but uh, the takeoff and the cruising were pretty much well first, and reaching the Ross London, there was a wind shear warning by the ATC. Of the Russian Transport Agency. Next, sir. The pilot decided for a go around instead of uh, approaching and landing for the first go around. There was no problem, but during the second go around, they had to ab abort the landing because they weren't mentally prepared for the second go around. And uh, the aircraft impacted the terrain about 600 kilometers per hour and pretty close down pitch, and we'll see why. Next, sir. The three major cause of the catastrophe were wind shear, weather conditions, and pilots' lack of dexterity to maneuver the aircraft, control surfaces, and psychological factors. Next, sir. Wind shear is a, a area of wind gradients or directional differences. Oh, we, can, we can skip this here. We know this. We have done a yeah. lecture. Okay, okay, okay. Next, Save next. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah sir. So, sir. The effect of wind shear that uh, affects the aircraft is like uh, when aircraft enters a headwind, the aircraft speed increases. So generally, the pilot reduces the engine power. It, when we enter the downdraft region, the aircraft speed is already reduced and the sink rate is increased, right? The local, uh, localized headwind diminishes and aircraft is already in low power and low speed descent, right? So when the uh, aircraft passes other side of the downdraft, the headwind becomes a tailwind and the lift generator is reduced. Next, sir. The control surface that responsible for the crash were like mainly horizontal Stabilizers and elevators, right, which are controlled by electrical trim switches and manual control columns, respectively. And the horizontal stabilizers and elevators control the longitudinal pitch. Next, we'll see the effect of control surfaces on the stability of our aircraft FZ 981, right? Mentally, the pirates were not prepared for the second go around, right? So they were stuck between the wind shear maneuver and the general go around procedure, right? The flap, flaps were detected to 15 degrees and the landing gear was already raised. The plane began to climb steeply and rapidly because the maximum thrust given by the pilot to overcome the wind shear was not required. The control columns were pushed forward that created the out of turn situation because the elevators moved in the opposite direction of the stabilizer and the plane space captured widely. Because the pilot wasn't aware of uh, the situation, the, he pitched the two trim switches that stabilizers moved in the nose down pitch uh, position and the flight entered a high speed dive. Next, sir. The psychological factors that came into play were like the pilots, as I said, mentioned before, the pilot was not prepared for the second go around. They were like mentally prepared for the approach and the landing. So the crew was performing a standard go around procedure with attacking the flags and landing gear, but the maximum thrust they gave were like for the wind shear escape maneuvers. And it was also accounted that the operational tiredness, like for six hours of the flight and two hours of the intense work, also played the part. And it was a nighttime flight, and both the pilots were new to the Ross and London air conditions. Next. The mismanagement of the cockpit included like the lack of dexterity of the operation of the manual stabilizer trim, which led to the long period 12 seconds of the continuous stabilizer nose down trim, which caused the substantial imbalance between the negative G and the crew wasn't prepared for it and caused a special disorientation. And the first officer also didn't took the command of the control column when the pilot was spatially disoriented. Next up. So after the investigations, the suggestions were made like the heads, heads up display should be made available for both the pilot and the first officer and the flight device should give more training uh, for the manual operation of the stabilizer trim. Next, sir. 30 seconds left. Uh, Roger. Um, the offset and negative G scenarios were also suggested and the uh, standard procedure for the uh, specifying the maneuvers, like windshield maneuver or go around. Next, sir. It was also suggested that the Russian transport agency should increase the scrutiny of the English proficiency because the ATC gave, didn't give the clear signatures, right? What was the wind, wind condition and is it turbulence or moderate wind shear, right? And the joint training should be conducted to the meteor with the meteorologist and uh, the ATC for better transmission of the wind shear information. And the Boeing should also, it was suggested that to revise the manual of the plane's behavior when the, the uh, thrust to uh, weight ratio is pretty high. Okay, thank you. I think this is, that's it. Time up. Uh, I want to give one very quick comment before we go ahead. See, uh, this is a supersonic presentation. You know, you have to plan it properly. Within four minutes, you cannot cover so much material in so much detail. And you kept on speaking so speedily that people could understand what you're saying. Or they were difficult to understand. That is not yes, the sir. way to make a presentation. I'm sorry. I'm not happy with the presentation. Okay, your content may be good, but the way you presented was you are running on a sprint like... Uh, you know, it's not, that's not the way to present in four minutes. You have to plan. It's four minutes only. So you have to uh, go for very specific points and only touch them. Okay. Over to you, Ashman. Okay. So uh, 
I would like you. Uh, I would like you to highlight uh, what were the weather conditions uh, when the plane was trying to uh, land at Rostov on Don, and uh, how did it uh, act as a contributing factor to the spatial orientation? Uh, sorry, spatial disorientation caused uh, to the captain, and how did it lead him to pushing the control column forward? So, under what conditions did the uh, deadly action by the captain occur? Yeah, uh, actually. Earlier, uh, it was uh, mentioned by the ATC that there was a moderate to severe wind shear and turbulence, right? And it was a snowy condition also. So what happened was the pilots uh, asked the ATC that whether it is possible to go for uh, go around or it is possible for approach or landing, right? So ATC gave the clearance at first, but when they reached uh, close to the runway, right? Then ATC informed that there is a wind shear, right? So pilot decided for a go around. But during the second time, they weren't prepared for the go around. They were like had to make an approach or landing because of the uh, conditions. Like uh, uh, it was already pretty late. Uh, what I'm asking is, after the second go around was uh, uh, completed, like you know, the uh, in the process of the second go around, when the second approach was missed, uh, yeah. what caused the pilot to uh, violently pitch the control column down? Yeah, because what causes was, spatial disorientation? This is what yeah, I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, there was a wind shear. There was a wind shear warning, so pilot decided to abort the landing, and the, they, uh, they were stuck between the wind shear maneuver and the normal go around. So the flaps were already reacted to 15 degrees, and the, the landing gear was raised. So the pilot gave extra thrust. The plane climbed very steeply, and they decided to control it by uh, pushing the control column forward. So elevator moved in a nose down position. So that caused the spatial uh, yeah, I, I I do get that, but uh, a lot of wind shears must be happening every day, right? But uh, in according to me, the pilots are trained how to handle wind shears. So what was uh, specific in this case, along with the wind shear, uh, that led to the pilot being spatially disoriented? Good question. Good question. Actually, uh, what I think is like uh, the uh, miscommunication at the ATC and I think they weren't specific about the whether it is a moderate wind shear or severe wind shear. That caused the pilot to be like confused whether to go a normal go around or wind shear. Uh, Alright, uh, let me... Let's let go me... on to the next question. Uh, Ashman, yeah. let's not linger because we don't have time okay. to linger. Let's go on to the next question. Alright. Uh, and another question is why was the second landing approach aborted? What caused the abortion of the second landing approach? Yeah, uh, the same thing, like the weather conditions. The, first, the uh, ATC announced, uh, can you see the runway, right? They said, yeah, we can see. But when they approached, there was a wind shear warning again by the ATC. The pilot got confused. So he was stuck between whether to take a wind shear maneuver or go around. Maneuver. So they ab aborted the landing and they had to go for a go around procedure. That was the thing. And earlier, the pilot uh, there, there was a, another aircraft, I think, Airbus that landed before. So the pilot decided to go, let's try for the second approach. That was the thing. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. Shall we go ahead now? So next presentation. Uh, so Akash, are you ready? Next presentation. Uh, yes, sir. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. One minute. What is the slide number? I think it is this one. Right? Are you able to see? Uh, no, sir. Not yet. Okay, wait. I wait. I'll have to share my screen. Okay, so now I will be sharing the screen. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. So, Akash, over to you. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning to all of you. I'm Akash Devethi representing the Nigerian 2120 aircraft accident in behalf of Team 10. Next. 
So next, these are the topics I am going to cover in the further slides. Firstly, I will give some brief introduction about the aircraft. Then I will be telling about the accident specifically. After that, we will see timeline found in cockpit voice recorded in the accident. Then after we will go through causal section followed by recommendation. And then at the last, references are given. Next. So, so here's some brief information about the aircraft is given, telling that the aircraft type was Douglas DC-861, which was operated by Nation Air on behalf of Nigerian Airways with the registration of Charlie Golf Mike x -ray. Akash, 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 save time. Charlie Golf Mike X is not important. Go ahead. Okay. Not, save your time, no? The origination was King Abdulaziz again, International. You are reading, again, you are reading from the screen. We can read it. No yes, need, to, No need. Just You can say this is the introduction and go ahead. Yes, you sir. can directly move so, on to the cause of the crash. Correct. Same okay. time. Okay, so, so I'll give some brief introduction about aircraft. The aircraft departed from Interna Abdulaziz International Airport. And problems Akash, you are reading the slide again. There is no need to read the slide. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your team will suffer if you just do this. We can read okay, the sir. slide. Okay, sir. Okay. So, so uh, move, move ahead, sir. Next. Uh, you can directly uh, specify the root cause of the crash. Okay. So actually, uh, 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 tire two and tire four have, was below minimum pressure, and it was uh, by mistake uh, given the clearance to take off, and which caused the uh, fire to go into the aircraft, and which caused the loss of hydraulics and loss of ailerons. And just uh, two point eight seven kilometer short of runway, the melting aircraft finally became uncontrollable and crashed. Next. So next, next. Uh, so these are the uh, time events. Okay. So this is these are the time events given, which tells the events happen time to time from real, uh, realizing the problem and to the uh, aircraft crash. Next. The other, these are the pictures listed. Uh, uh, these are the list uh, pictures telling that how the disastrous accident was. Next. So these are the causes that uh, minimum pressure was below for flight dispatch, which, which should be around 200 PSI. And it was the responsibility of lead mechanic and project manager because they gave the clearance. Next. So uh, after this, uh, the, when the tire was below minimum pressure, one of the tires stopped rotating and friction generated, we eventually generated fire, which went in. And since the hydraulic system and the pressurization system was in close proximity, so it got caught fire, which eventually led to the failure of uh, uh, ailerons and CPR. Next. So these are the recommendations given after this accident that the, uh, there should be wheel wheel fire protection and the temperature sensors so that the cockpit pilot can get the warning of the fire hot inside, uh, inside the uh, flight and the use of complete operating manuals and procedure during the aircraft uh, to take off, use of maintenance manuals and procedure which are capable, current and accurate. Next. And furthermore, the proper training and quality assurance for aircraft maintenance engineers, aircraft mechanics, and technician and other specialists. The training of, uh, Roger, the training of maintenance personnel to include adequate information on the tire servicing and vulnerability to safe operation. Next. So these are the inf uh, references we have taken for gathering the information. That was all about my presentation. Thank you. OK, Ashman, over to you. Uh, all right. So you mentioned that uh, the tire pressure in number two and number four engines was less, right? So yes. uh, I first of all, I want you to mention which gas is used in the uh, filling up of the tires. And uh, also the second thing I want you to mention is that, uh, you know, we know that the project manager, the project manager knew that uh, this, uh, you know, since the tire pressure is less, so obviously the plane should not take off. So what uh, what caused them to uh, make the aircraft seem airworthy? Okay, so I'll answer that. First of all, for the first question, what uh, gas is filled in the tires is, it can either be air or nitrogen. That depends like, right, on what you are right. using. It and, can either uh, be air or nitrogen. Yeah. And second, for second answer is, like when the project manager was aware that the tire, in one of the tires, pressure was less, not all the tires. So he allowed the flight because like if he wouldn't have allowed it, this would have caused him uh, financial implications as well as might it might let him to lose his job. Because what happens is when you delay the aircraft, you have to give reasons. Okay. And when small, uh, he thought that such a small delay will lead to the financial implications to this flight. 
so he allowed like uh, he cleared the aircraft and let it like he gave a fit to fly certificate so that it can take off uh, all right and uh, another question i want you to uh, i want to ask you is uh, so after taking off uh, after once the aircraft was airborne after taking off how could this air, uh, how could this disaster have been prevented okay so like we have told in the presentation that first of all the fire started from the wheel well and there were no fire uh, detectors there had fire detectors been there it would have led to aversion of this disaster secondly when the uh, captain all right all right yeah uh, i want to i want to interrupt here uh, and ask that assume that there were fire detectors in that uh, in that region so after taking off uh, had the fire detectors detected some fire uh, how would the tragedy have been prevented how okay had the fire detectors would have detected fire they would have taken a decision to go around and come back and land it secondly they would have retracted the landing gear immediately so that whatever fire is there could be uh, like extinguished with the help of the external air which like when the aircraft is flying and they could have uh, retracted the landing gear and immediately gave a call to uh, they would have immediately raised an emergency and take a call to land back all right and uh, one last question i want to ask is uh, what was the implication of this crash on the uh, on the airline nation air okay, so nation air as you see like they were leasing the aircrafts out and this was the deadliest disaster for them uh, in their entire history but the obviously the aircraft uh, the uh, what we say the company went into some losses after the crash because all the fleets were down to upgrade the fleet with the fire uh, detectors and fire sensors in the wheel well but eventually they recovered yes all right that's that's it okay thank you so much next team is team 4 learjet 45 in mexico city get ready team 4 and i'm going yes to... sir i'm there sir right 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 i'm going to yes, madam move it while yes sir so yeah, it is minute. second one minute. one minute i know i know i know i know it's a second slide number 22 my god 21 slides have been created for a four minute presentation okay great right so the screen is modified yeah screen not visible wait a minute let me that is my problem i will share the screen Okay, visible now. Yes, sir. Okay, so permission to start, sir. Yes, Roger, Roger, given. Okay. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Team Four, I am Lieutenant Commander Mohit Valia, going to present a case study towards the crash investigation which has happened at Mexico City for an aircraft Learjet 45. Next slide, please. This is going to be the floor presentation for next four minutes. Next slide, please. Now let's see why the crash has happened. next please the aircraft was departed from san luis airport and uh, going towards the mexico city international uh, airport next please the aircraft carries the nine passenger on board the radar contact was lost just uh, at atc just 30 miles away when the altitude is uh, less than 10000 feet and during the investigation it has been observed that it has got entangled himself into the wake turbulence of an aircraft which is in front of him which is a boeing 767 and suddenly it has uh, lost the lift uh, loss of lift has occurred and the aircraft dived down into the mexico city in the rush hours and there is a casualty in two digits next please these are the various photographs of the aircraft wreckage as you can see next please now let's see what is wake turbulence is all about as it has been taught to us in in class activity that it is directly related to the induced drag and induced drag uh, Uh, is a lift dependent drag isn't it okay next let's next please now these are the various types of drags which uh, occur on a flying body and here we are talking about this induced drag which is lift dependent drag and the wing tip vortices which are generated because of induced drag next please this is the mathematical representation of induced drag and the factors on which it depends on next please now the first factor on which wake turbulence depends is the all up weight of the aircraft higher is the all up weight higher will be the wake turbulence and wing tip uh, wing tip vortices which will be generated from the aircraft next please certainly the aspect ratio is inversely proportional to the induced drag coefficient next please uh, it has been reflected both in the pictorial form as well as the graphical form the third and the fourth factor is it is directly 
proportional it is inversely correct it is inversely proportional to the speed and directly proportional to the angle of attack that is what is depicted in this particular slide next please of course uh, another factor which impacts the wake turbulence is the ground effect which is disadvantageous during takeoff as well as landing uh, next please now wind speeds have a certain effect on the wake turbulence the wake will move towards the direction of the wing that is what has been depicted in pictorial representation here next please now this is supposed to be the thumb rule across the various regulatory bodies and the uh, aviation uh, airlines that uh, whenever the aircraft is dropping the wake it will sustain at a vertical height of 500 to 900 feet and up to the 5 nautical mile the impact of the intensity of the wing tip vortices and total turbulence can be felt next please this is how we can avoid getting into the wake turbulence that is what has been depicted in various uh, reasons of flying whether take off landing and uh, maneuvering next please now the downwash for the aircraft in front uh, certainly becomes the upwash for the aircraft at the back if it is it is of a small or the light uh, weight it will certainly have the various effect of structural loading and load imposing uh, there will be a loss of uh, climb uh, there will be a loss of altitude which is certainly advantage yes next please 30 seconds remain yes yes uh, roger next please this is how we are categorizing the aircraft on the basis of weight which is a far and the dgc regulation next please this is how the minimum distance which has been uh, directed by the various authorities next please this shows the statistics of what are uh, various accident which has happened because of wake turbulence next please this is the final lesser learn the wake turbulence has been re recently uh, recategorized where the wind factor Time has up. been added. and uh, the, okay and the political reason is also one of the factor in this case and proper pilot training and certification of the institute from where pilots have got trained is into it thank you so much for the patience all right so okay. uh, yeah so the the separation that you mentioned between two aircraft uh, we know that a boeing 767 was flying in front of the uh, uh, given learjet in question uh the separation was uh, definitely slightly greater than 5 nautical miles still it encountered wake turbulence from that boeing 767 and uh, uh and suffered uh, this downwash and crashed so uh, how did the uh, how did the weather conditions contribute to uh, uh such like how did the weather uh, how did the weather conditions contribute to uh, such the uh, sorry how did the weather country uh, so uh, how did the weather conditions contribute to uh, the uh, the wake turbulence okay uh, the wake if the weather is clear the wind speeds are uh, less certainly the wake turbulence are there to stay at that particular moment i agree with the first statement that you said that the separation between the front aircraft and the follower aircraft is is more than 5 nautical mile in one of the uh, case investigation because here there is another angle to this particular uh, crash which has happened in mexico this aircraft uh, there is a passenger who is a government official and going to be the next president going to uh, be the candidate for the next president elect elections in mexico states no but so, sorry, 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 sorry sorry the question is not about uh, that the question is about the wind can you yes, answer so if if the weather is clear if if weather is clear the wake turbulence will stay till 5 nautical miles and if weather is uh, not uh, if the wind speeds are high the wake turbulence can be uh, reduced to a lesser distance between the two separating aircraft that is what is the final conclusion also that we are uh, concluding the uh, wake turbulence uh, mitigation process which has been given by the regulating authority uh, far and right, that is that much is sufficient uh, uh, the question of which i want to ask is uh, uh looking at the decent profile of the aircraft just before the crash occurred uh, what can you comment on the qualification of the pilots uh, were they qualified enough and knowledgeable enough to fly the plane why or why not okay uh, this is another uh, the outcome of our study the, the last two points is that the pilot training is not sufficient they are not uh, competent on learjet four five flying as they were flying the other aircraft previously and these pilots are the private hired contractor who are working for the government aircraft 
certainly the second point is that the from where they have got their certification about the flying there are loopholes which has been fine during the investigation that that certifying air air uh, airline school is also in doubt and their registrations have been cancelled and their licenses has been cancelled post this particular accident so both has been a big question mark as far as pilot and the training institute has been concerned after this particular case okay we have to move on to the last one sorry we are a bit late but we had to go ahead uh, i hope everybody is okay if we can go for another 5 minutes or another 8 minutes okay so now team 5 you are remaining for transfer airlines flight 800 So team number five, are you there? Team number five, you are there? Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Go ahead. You can start now. Okay, sir. Next slide, please. Next slide. One minute. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, this is the timeline of the events preceding the accident for Transworld Airlines 800. 12 minutes into the flight, while climbing to 15,000 feet, uh, CVR and FTR recordings ended abruptly. Next slide, please. Uh, so here you can you can see the picture. Uh, this this is a picture of radar tape just before the accident. Uh, you can see an unidentified object close to the aircraft just before the crash. uh based on the early based on this early speculations like new uh, us navy missile took down the aircraft from air uh, later this image was identified as an interference image from another aircraft and the other possibilities were ruled out by faulty and the structural analysis of the wreckage finally the conclusion was that the explosion started in the central wing fuel tank next slide sir Uh, so the accident source of ignition energy for fuel air explosion in the fuel uh, for the fuel air explosion in the central wing fuel tank is the electrical spark in it due to short circuit. This was confirmed from the cockpit voice recorder readings. Uh, in the below picture, you can see a minuscule pauses in the audio signal in the last few seconds before the accident due to this was due to momentary power loss because of short circuit. Next slide, sir. uh the actual series of events are as follows uh here the low voltage uh, fuel quantity indication system wiring and the high voltage ac wiring were bundled up together um so uh, the condition of uh, condition of the wiring was bad which led to short circuit that resulted in voltage spike in the uh, fuel quantity indication system wiring within the central wing fuel tank uh, so due to formation of electric arc in the fuel tank fuel vapors ignited and the exploded tank Smashed onto the fuselage, uh, which led to mid-air disintegration of the aircraft. Next slide, sir. Uh, coming to the reasons for the accident, uh, here in the picture you can see AC ducts uh, which are adjacent to the central wing fuel tank. Uh, these transferred heat into the fuel tank uh, since there was no proper uh, thermal and electrical insulation, and uh, because there is no means to reduce the heat transfer to the fuel, the temperature of the fuel. a uh, vapor form exceeded the fuel flash point which made the fuel flammable next slide sir oh, sorry sorry uh, previous slide please um the condition of the wiring is also a reason and the silver sulf and silver sulfide which is semiconductor when is deposited on fks wiring these deposited these deposits break down and result in electrical arcing when exposed to high voltage next slide sir uh the lessons learned from the accident are uh, the idle standby time of the aircraft uh, while the acs are running has to be reduced proper distance should be maintained for uh, thermal insulation uh, in flight monitoring of fuel and fuel tank temperature is required uh, there is a need for periodic maintenance of wiring and the explosive wipes should be handled better next slide sir uh, after the accident the following changes are incorporated in the aviation industry Uh, by using nitrogen for inerting uh, 30 seconds fuel, remaining uh, fuel tank is inerted with nitrogen you have uh, to acknowledge probe. you have to acknowledge say roger fuel probe uh, roger uh, uh -huh. fuel probes which had uh, sharp edges earlier were replaced fuel quantity indication system is protected from high voltage with surge protection system to keep the fuel temperature 
low refueling can be done from cooler underground fuel tanks and periodic inspections are done to ensure the proper maintenance of the electric shielding of wiring next slide sir time up so these are the references thank you right ashman all right uh, so uh, i would like to mention one fact that uh, before taking off from new york jfk airport uh, the plane was delayed and uh, it had to sit and wait on the tarmac for a few hours so uh, something had happened uh, during during this few hours which uh, which triggered of a series of events which led to the disaster what was it and uh, explain in detail how that happened okay i'd like to answer this question yeah uh, go ahead prior to the take off the aircraft was there at the airport uh, it had to wait for the two and a half hours because of an uh, unattended luggage in the aircraft this caused the delay during this whole during time the two two of the air conditioners of the three ac packs not reading, but of the aircraft it, the akash please was, keep quiet akash your voice is on put your mute yourself akash yeah so two of the three ac packs were on uh, during this whole time these central ac packs are located just below the central wing tank of the aircraft so the heat from this uh, ac packs are being transferred to the central wing tank and uh, because of the deteriorated uh, insulation of the ducts which is surrounding uh, the ac ducts which are surrounding the central wing tank the heat is being transferred and due to the location of the central wing tank is such that the heat cannot be uh, transferred from dissipated from the central wing tank this raises the uh, temperature of the fuel air vapor inside it also because of the leg shorter leg from uh, new york to paris the central tank was almost empty so it was not filled so other tanks were filled because they required only that much of fuel only so because of the law, the more presence of uh, more area in the volume inside the uh, tank the fuel air vapor was more mm. and the from the short circuit because of uh, to the uh, fqs system uh, wire due to a short circuit a high voltage was transferred to this fqs system uh, which right, could have led to the, I think, I think the question which was required for yeah yeah you are going okay. beyond the question sorry yeah. you you are you have to have some sense of timing also no? don't try to give next all second. the answers in one question yeah next question ashman uh yeah just a second uh i know there is a lot of excitement but you have to curtail it okay uh so uh so i i have a yeah. uh, they have not mentioned what changes were done uh, i was coming to that i have one ah. more question after that i am coming to that okay okay uh, so uh yeah uh, well, in this presentation it was mentioned that the high voltage and low voltage wires were bundled together so right. uh, what what happened uh, in uh, in respect to this which led to the uh, Uh, occurrence of a short circuit, which eventually caused the explosion. I would like uh, to take up the question. Sure, sure, go ahead. Ah, uh, since they were bundled up together and the wiring was and the insulation was not proper, I mean the wiring was not uh, wiring was worn out. So, ah, uh, since the wiring was worn out, ah, uh, the high voltage. high voltage uh, current passed into this low voltage fuel quantity indication system wiring so that was also present inside the central wing fuel tank uh all right uh, just one more question to follow it up uh, so uh so a high amount of current from the high voltage uh, high voltage uh, uh, power carrying wires it due to the short circuit it must have gone into the low voltage wires so uh, how did the uh, power surge that was created in the low voltage wires end up in the fuel tank and how did it cause this explosion uh, time up uh, i would like to answer this question yeah answer it quickly please Yes, uh, there was a terminal block for the fuel quantity indicator inside the cent uh, centralized fuel uh, uh, fuel tank. So what has happened is the high voltage that has uh, gone into the low voltage wire of FQIS that is fuel quantity indicator system. It has gone inside that uh, fuel quantity indicator where it, there was a terminal block 
which had some earthing uh, thing uh, along with it, which had sharp edges. So what happened with this sharp edges was the insulation of those uh, grounding wires had broken and those resulted into the shock, which uh, reacted with the uh, uh, fuel vapor, which was beyond its flash point and uh, resulted in the ignition of the fuel tank. Oh, all right. And like, okay, Arman, permit think... me to... Yeah, if you would permit me to ask, like, uh, what were the recommendations or what were the improvements made from the crash? So basically, there is oxygen. There was uh, there are fuel vapors present uh, present in the fuel edge of the fuel tank. So to prevent this vapors uh, vapors forming, the fuel tank is pressurized uh, pressurized with nitrogen, which is very inert. Mm, that okay. is one of the changes made. And, uh, um, and the fuel probes are sh uh, had sharp edges earlier, uh, which damaged the wiring. So they were replaced, and there was uh, and the surge and a surge protection system for fuel quantity indication system was installed in the in the airplanes after the incident. All right. Thank you. Sir, I want to add, sir, that uh, earlier there was no temperature indicator uh, indicating system in the fuel, and after that. Uh, 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 they were provided that uh, temperature indicated system in the fuel tank so that uh, the pilot uh, come to know about what is the temperature of the fuel right now. Okay. okay, I think we have already gone very much beyond our class because of, uh, but we wanted to finish 10 presentations today and uh, we will resume now with the second presentation of each team in some random sequence uh, on Friday, okay. So I'm happy with the, whatever I saw because it seems that all the teams have actually put in quite good effort in trying to come to the grips with the, uh, with the accident. And mostly they've been able to answer all the questions, which shows that they have done a very good job. So that's very nice and very encouraging. Okay, so we will meet again on uh, Friday morning. Huh? Thank you, Ashman, for your very incisive questions. And Thank also you, to Tirupadi, Tiruvadi for <laughs> timekeeping. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the meeting. I think I prefer that we meet on this rather than MS Teams. So we will next time we will meet only on this. Uh, tell everybody that the presenters are going to be there. And uh, in fact, what we will do is we will just do first come first serve. The first hundred people will be on the meeting and the remaining will go on the YouTube. Okay, let's not uh, because sometimes there are other team members who can answer the question better, but they are not here. So we will open up. We will open up first come first serve on Friday and those who are spillover will go to the YouTube. Okay. Any comments? Anybody has very quickly, we can do that before we go.